Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ESE talks. Uh, today and tomorrow, we will have the topic of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Today, part uh, number one. And before I will introduce our faculty of the day, um, I would like to encourage everybody who is online to put the questions and uh, comments into the Q&A session. And at the end of each talk, we will have time to then um, go into the questions and answers and comments. And um, I would like to welcome you here on this uh, topic of endocrine disrupting chemicals. As we have seen during the last uh, European Congresses of Endocrinology and uh, other sessions, this topic is of high interest to the endocrine community. So we decided to really address uh, two of uh, these main sets today and tomorrow in a series of talks. Um, today you will see uh, four talks, tomorrow you will uh, have a little bit more specifics. And before I go through the individual programs, uh, my name is Josef Kurle. I am um, a senior professor at the Charité University in Berlin. And together with uh, my um, co-chair and co-lead of the focus area of endocrine, of environmental endocrinology. You will hear and see her tomorrow, Paulina Damdimopolo. We are uh, leading and chairing these two sessions today. Um, my uh, background is uh, from the biochemistry side. I was working on the thyroid hormone system and also on endocrine disruptors over the last few years. And the second talk will then be by Angel Nadal. I will introduce him later on from Spain, uh, mainly on the metabolic system, especially uh, the pancreatic island. The third talk will be then uh, by Alexandra Buha from Serbia. I will also introduce her with reproductive health. And the last talk will be by Stefano Chan Farani from Italy. He's representing the ESPE, European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology. And we are quite happy that this is a joint enterprise between ESE and ESPE in the field of endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals and environmental endocrinology. And just a preview of tomorrow, Tomorrow's session will be chaired by Anna Maria Anderson. She is uh, the outgoing chair uh, on co-lead of the focus area. We will then devote tomorrow to a specific groups of uh, endocrine disruptions, which are really the, uh, among the highest priority agents, the polyfluorinated um, compounds. And there we have uh, three talks by uh, Torhalur Hal Dorson from Iceland, by Paulina Damdimopolo from Sweden, uh, she's addressing, uh, let's say, the stages of pregnancy. And the final part, again, will be in the collaboration with um, ESPE uh, by Inge Beisterfeld from the Netherlands. And this will happen then tomorrow evening at the same time. And we are proud and happy that uh, you are interested in these aspects. Now, before we go in any details, a few definitions. An endocrine disruptor is an exogenous substance or mixture that alters the function of the endocrine system. And now two very important words come. And consequently, so there is a causal adverse effect to be related in an intact organism in the progeny or subpopulation. This is a classical uh, WHO um, uh, definition from 2002. And there is, of course, a lot of potential endocrine disruptors, which have, let's say, the same characteristics. But here, the end consequently is not yet established by sufficient data, but maybe evidence from um, epidemiology and others. So the major steps ahead were this uh, statement of the endocrine uh, disrupting uh, chemicals uh, science from 2012 by WHO and UNEP. This was a leading report, endocrine disrupting chemicals from 2012. You can find it on the internet. Then the Endocrine Society of um, uh, really uh, made two major statements. These were the first scientific statements the Endocrine Society ever made in 2009, and then an update 
made in 2015, which you can also find in the internet. And finally, I think another major step ahead, fortunately, was um, three years ago when the EU Commission published the chemical strategy for sustainability towards a toxic free environment. So this is really now the starting point where a lot of statements are made and these have now to be implemented. So I will not go into too many details of uh, key characteristics of endocrine disrupting compounds, in short, always EDCs. We know that they are interfering with hormone receptors, either as agonists, antagonists, they might alter the receptor expression. They might interfere with the signal transduction of the receptors. They might interfere with hormone synthesis, storage, secretion, with hormone transport for those hormones which need transport, with hormone distribution and concentration, with activation, metabolism and clearance. So a lot of very complicated steps. You find them on the left here uh, in, uh, in the, uh, on the screen. Various mechanisms can involve. And they might also affect the fate of hormone producing or hormone responsive cells. And what we have learned recently is a lot of epigenetic uh, interactions can really occur. So a big spectrum and we will try to be as um, easy for the entry as possible. Now, what are some key characteristics of the EDCs? They bioaccumulate along the food chain. They bioaccumulate, for example, in fat cells. You will hear today and tomorrow about that. And they might be mobilized during a different stage of physiology in the female body, for example, during pregnancy and lactation. Some of them are short-lived. Some of them are long-lived. And the long-lived ones are the persistent organic polluters, POPs. There are some compounds which are around since many, many years and will stay around. And there are uh, new developments that some of these compounds are replaced by others, bad or worse or better. And an issue which is really a lot, causing a lot of grief, they are not alone. It's not only one exposure, there are exposure to multiple mixtures, and this makes really things very complicated. And on top of it, in contrast to classical toxicology, many of these relationships of exposure and response are nonlinear, non-monotonic, J or use curve. And the whole story started many, many years ago uh, when it was discovered that the diethylstilbestrol, which was used as a very potent estrogen, described in the 50s, when the daughters of these mothers treated with those steroids, developed adenocarcinoma, very rare. The sons developed disturbances to their reproductive system. And currently, we have two millions of daughters or sons and grandchildren whose mothers or grandmothers were exposed to the first bona fide the, um, endocrine disruptor, the still still destroyed. So, this is kind of the short introduction. And I would now like to ask if you have any question already that you come forward. Otherwise, we will then go into the first uh, talk. Now, as I mentioned already, we are at the Charité in Berlin and uh, together with the European Society, we are uh, working in the uh, focus area of environmental endocrinology and the EDC working group over the last years. And we'll try to start here now what's going on. The definition you have already heard that we have to do this and consequently interference. Now, when the endocrine disruptors will interfere with the hormone system, they might mimic a naturally produced hormone. They might mimic all steps in endocrinology, activation and action of hormones. And they might uh, change the set points, especially, and this is an issue which we do not really fully understand, but we have a strong evidence that this occurs, that they might change the set points of endocrine axis in transgenerational mode. This means for the sons, grandsons, and even uh, grandchildren later on. A few points for the terminology. Um, EDC meaning endocrine disrupting compound or chemical. 
there will also be a term which you will find metabolism disrupting compound. This is kind of a subgroup, but same principle. And you will also hear of obesogens. These are now compounds who interfere mainly with the lipid metabolism and might be involved in leading to obesity. And I think our speakers will address a lot of uh, these issues later on. Pops. Persistent organic polluters, these are the real problems because they are around and will be around for 10 years or five years or even longer. And from this um, uh, EU uh, CSS strategy, we are now counting the endocrine disrupting compounds where the causal effect relationship is already established as substances of very high concern, SVHCs. Now these are now at the same level as carcinogens teratogens or reproductive system disrupting compounds. We have in Europe, in the EU, a European chemical agency, which is involved in really clearing the data and, uh, uh, and checking the data. We have the European Food Safety Agency. I will come back to that. Uh, this is an agency only uh, dealing with the food, not with chemicals in general. And we have the REACH process in the EU. You have heard about that registration, evaluation, authorization of chemicals. And we have, as you have heard, the chemical strategy for sustainability by the EU. And we have two other terms. We have hazard evaluation in the research and we have risk assessment. And this is different. This is a potential risk. This is really risk in the, the context of exposure data. And this is done by the environmental agency, by many of the agency and not uh, mainly a focus of interest of the research primarily. Now, when it comes to the groups of endocrine disrupting chemicals, they come from various sources. They come from industry, agriculture. They are found in consumer products, which you see here. They are in cosmetics, but they are also in the medical community contained in pharmaceuticals, in medical uh, products and device. And they are in plastic. And some of them, you might have heard about isoflavones or phytoestrogens come from mother nature. Now, what are the characteristics? Many of these are stable and persistent, not all of them. Some of them are accumulating, as we have heard, and all of them will interfere with the hormone system, with reproductive, but not solely with the endocrine system, but also with the immune system, which is uh, an issue coming up later on. Now, which classes of chemicals do we have? We have heavy metals. Um, uh, Alexandra Buha will, for example, talk a little bit. We have combustion products from burning of very many materials. We have among the pharmaceuticals compounds. We have the classical pesticides like DDT. We have the plasticizers making plastic soft and uh, workable. We have, for example, the monomers in plastic production like bisphenol A. And we have uh, flame retardants, which are <clears throat> compounds um, where you prepare and impregnate your uh, furniture, your curtains, uh, to deter uh, that they are uh, burning easily. We have a lot of detergents, surfactants, and we have the persistent ones and the food ones, for example, from soy. So a lot of them are around. And DDT, for example, just to remind you, was discovered by Paul Muller already in 1935. He received the Nobel Prize Award for this compound in 42. And today, DDT is a major problem in this context. So um, history tells what's really coming up. I will not go in any detail into this timeline. The first really concerns were raised in the 60s when Rachel Carson published the book, Silent Spring. There was several conferences. Then the WHO started to deal with endocrine disruptors, the endocrine society statement. And finally, also in Europe, things are getting moving and get ahead. So a lot of things to come. And I think with the uh, chemical strategy, we have now a turning point since three years because we can now demand from our politicians, from our governments, from our regulatory authorities that they act according to what we know, what science has produced so far, and that it's implemented and not only discussed about. If you look in PubMed, 
I did it for before the weekend, and you search for endocrine disruptor, you find 14,000 results. The first paper really under this head of 1987 in scientific literature. If you expand the search to endocrine disruptor and randomized controlled clinical trials, you hardly find 31 results. And if you look carefully, none of these are really clinical studies, as you would say. And the first one appeared in 2001. So in terms of clinical endocrinology beyond epidemiology, we have a lot of things to do and we should maybe on discuss that later. Now, what is the evidence for the environmental uh, problems? We have a decline in child, childbirth all over the world. This is the sum on the left side on the world. If you look in Japan, USA, fertility is decreasing. There has been a lot of discussion, controversial discussion on sperm quality decrease. And if you look, for example, by many studies from our Scandinavian colleagues, that during the last 40 years, sperm quality seems to decline, but there is controversy on the methods and so on. But nevertheless, the net sum is we lose fertility, uh, fertility uh, success. And if you look what a population will need in terms of birth rate, fertility rate, you need 2.1 births uh, for, by a woman to maintain a population over a longer time. So we are approaching or even currently already below that number. On the other hand, if you look what's happening in uh, testicular cancer, there are data from, again, various parts of the world. You see worldwide increase in testicular cancer. If you look at puberty, and this will be an issue then tomorrow, uh, you will see that some of the issues of puberty, like precocious pu puberty uh, and, and uh, central or uh, is increasing, uh, uh, the incidence per thousand and our pediatric colleagues will give probably some more insight on that, uh, what is happening. So there are different trends which suggest that the endocrine system, the reproductive system, the metabolic system are changing. And obviously this is not monocausal only by endocrine disrupting compounds, many other points in society, lifestyle, economy, uh, way of living uh, contribute to these changes. Just to give you a preview of what happens tomorrow, for example, our colleague um, uh, from Sweden will uh, report on that. She studied in 20 pregnancies ending in stillbirth, the uh, content of endocrine disruptors in the mother, in the fetus, in the uh, cord blood, and look at this figure here on the fatty tissue of the baby. There is one group of chemicals, which is 9,000 fold higher on the baby side compared to the mother. So this I think is really a, a concerning data fact and she will tell a little bit more on what that means in reality. What we know in terms of transgenerational effects is that maternal nutrition is very well known to be important for the baby and the baby is uh, let's say two generations in a mother's womb. So the baby is F1 generation, but the baby has already germ cells, either ovary or testes, which are the next generation. So when the mother is exposed to changes in nutrition, we know that from obesity, we know that from diabetes, this will have already impact on two generations manifesting later on in uh, generation F2 and F3. And the same if nutrition has such an influence, obviously we must suspect that all the endocrine disrupting compounds might such have such, evident, uh, such effects already in the fetus on two generations and in the offspring then on generations three. So what we have learned over the years from Barker in United Kingdom, from uh, the school of Donner at Charité in Germany, that during development from the germ cell over the embryo, during adolescence, puberty, reproductive phase, menopause, andropause, and, and elderly. They are critical windows of susceptibility where the endocrine system has an increased risk to be affected by any adverse effects, either by nutrition or by, uh, let's say, endocrine disrupting compounds applied dermally via nutrition or via the air. So that we know, and we have to find the mechanisms involved here. Now, uh, we will hear a little bit on that. 
we have one compound, a tributyltin. This is a biocide in anti-fouling paintings of ships or uh, things which are in the water. And this, for this compound, it is known that it can act in um, developing fat cell as an obesogen. Via the p par gamma mechanism, we will have more adipocytes and uh, alterations in the stem cell, and this will predispose them to obesity. And this has been shown in animal experiments quite well, and there is strong evidence also that the same is happening in humans. So these obesogens might interfere with the nuclear receptors like p par gamma. They might have epigenetic effects via DNA methylation or histone methylation, and they will then affect the metabolism and change the metabolic set points and then increase the risk of obesity. That does not mean every exposure will have a causal effect, but it will contribute or we facilitate or will be increasing the risk. Now, one point to the dose and concentration responses of the endocrine disruptors. What you see here on this graph is the yellow line, where, which is the classical uh, let's say, model of toxicology at a specific threshold, which might be here at concentration A or B, you will get an increased risk of any adverse effect or response in the biological system. And as we know from the hormone system, the hormone system is not linear. You have uh, in the hormone system too much of a hormone or too little of a hormone can have or may have the same effect. So, uh, concentration response or a dose response curve in a hormone will not be linear, but will have a maximum either like here, U-shaped or inverted U-shaped or J-shaped. So there is not for all of the endocrine effects a linear dose response relationship, but non-linear, non-monotonic dose response relationship. And this is a big fight and has been a big fight between classical toxicology and endocrinology and needs to further work. So we have non-classical dose response relationship. For most of the endocrine disrupting compounds, we have no threshold concentration. We can probably not say that any concentration and exposure is uh, harmless or will have no effect. And we are in the endocrine system, especially in the humans, frequently uh, confronted with associations in animal experiments, in cell culture, in vitro studies, we can establish clear cause effect relationship. But in the human studies, we have to rely on association, we have to rely on epidemiology, but our well established animal models give us strong evidence in terms of conservation of the endocrine system that there are really cause effect relationships also in humans. So, what is our reality? And I come to the end of my presentation. So currently, we have probably around 100,000 chemicals in the daily life products, computers, mobiles, cars, and so on. We have 350 chemicals used in commerce somewhere on our globe, 350,000 chemicals. Now, we have around 75,000 mixtures, polymers, and unknown, what we don't really know what is in these mixtures and products. We have approximately 120,000 compounds which are not chemically identifiable anymore after the technical processes. So we don't know what it is really. Every hour we discover, our scientists discover 40 new chemicals. Not all of them are used, but they are discovered. And now the question to you, what do you think, how many chemicals or chemical groups are globally regulated out of these 350,000? If I would have now, uh, let's say a question answer uh, with some uh, voting on the mobile, I would be interested in hearing your answer. 1,000, 10,000 or less. Globally regulated are currently around only 50 compounds from 350,000 chemicals. And of these, uh, at least 25 are endocrine disrupting compounds. So you see the problem ahead of us, we need to work on that. And how do we work on that? What you see here is a graph from a nature paper, very important nature paper from uh, 2020. In the green line on the top, you see what was the biomass on our planet during the last 120 years? 
it's almost constant. And below you see what was anthropogenic mass, all products made by humans since 1900 on the left, 2020 on the right. So we have an exponential increase in anthropogenic mass in our globe. And in the year 2000, the anthropogenic mass exceeded the biomass on our planet. And this is continuing, sorry. So what does it mean? We have more buildings, infrastructure than trees, sharp green plants. And we have doubled the amount of plastic compared to the all animals, including insects on our planet. That is the problem of our future. And plastic is one of the sources, not the only one of endocrine disrupting compounds. Now, we have these numbers. The biomass is shrinking, not increasing, but the anthropogenic mass is increasing exponentially. For each person, objects are formed per week, which correspond to their body weight. So your body weight is, let's say, doubled by plastic and by anthropogenic materials every day, every week, sorry. And the plastic waste in our aquatic compartments, rivers, seas, the sea, is already 10% of the whole plastic waste on the world. So we have really an issue which we need to solve. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. There is a human biomonitoring project uh, in the EU for many years now, guided by the Environmental Agency in Berlin, but all over Europe and other countries. And they showed that regulation, if it's done by the regulatory authorities, by their uh, responsible in um, authorities, you can regulate and decrease exposure here for, for some phthalates. But these are on the left graphs, those which are regulated, but new ones are coming in, which are substituting and they are increasing, sorry. And in our individuals, we have now 400 chemicals detectable in each of EU person, 10 phthalates in the child's, child's children between eight and 10. And for some of the exposures, they are already so high that they are reaching health threat according to this study of the EU. And the good message here of our colleagues from the HMB for You consortium, you can reduce your current chemical exposure or by your consumer decision by changing food, cosmetics, body care, lifestyle. And that is a good message. EFSA has recently responded and you might have seen this. EFSA lowered the uh, tolerated daily intake level for bisphenol A by a factor of 20,000 since 2015. This is a spectacular decision. And the EU must now really with this chemical strategy Use the precautionary principle, protect the public from exposure to harm when scientific investigation has found a plausible risk, and that is the case. And I think one of the conclusions, this is uh, not only my personal point of view, the polluter who brings such a compound into our environment has finally also to pay and not only take the profit. But this is controversial. So in summary, endocrine disruption is real. We have in silico, in vitro, ex vivo, in vivo data from animal experiments, and we have human epidemiology. Pregnant women are among the most sensitive risk groups. We can do something a little bit about that. And we have to really reduce the exposure to the substances of very high concern and the chemical strategy of sustainability has to be implemented on the national level, at the EU level, and at the global level. And prevention is part of the cure. It's not the only cure. And I thank you for your attention. Unfortunately, I took a little bit longer than my plan was, but I hope you got some idea for the introduction. So, any question, please bring them in the question and answer session, and then we will hand it over and discuss uh, over the uh, panel. Joseph, there is a one question for you in the Q&A box. Um, did you want to stop your presentation to read that one? Okay, I'll stop it. Okay. And then if you open the Q&A box. 
So the regarding definition. So what is the question of uh, the definition of an endocrine disruptor? An endocrine disruptor is interfering with the hormone system and causes adverse changes. That is a definition of an established endocrine disruptor. And then there are the putative possible endocrine disruptors where a lot of data from in vitro animal experimental studies indicate that there is a cause effect relationship, but we do not have sufficient data to make that uh, pretty, pretty safe. Now, another question uh, from Claudia Sedlinski. Uh, some efforts are in progress to get rid of industrial or plastic derived EDC, but how can we manage pharmaceutical derived EDCs? Good question for the medical community. Uh, I have discussed this with my colleagues. Of course, uh, physicians, uh, doctors uh, treating chits and adults obviously need uh, pharmaceutical preparations to bring the active ingredients in the form of a drug or a pill to the patient. There is two points which could be considered. First of all, there is a development that medical devices like plastic tubing, soft plastics for catheters and so on, can be replaced by plastics which is low or not as highly contaminated by endocrine disruptors. There are products on the market, many of them are more expensive, but one can reduce the exposure, which in that case frequently is an in, v, in IV exposure to endocrine disruptors. Think of the neonatal intensive care, think of intensive care in general. That's one point. The other point is in the tablets, many of the pills, in the coating, there are compounds which make the coating, let's say, uh, pass uh, until the intestinal resorption that they don't dissolve. We can again, change something in the uh, additives which we add to the coatings of the pills. But this is a long process and there are ways to go that, but I think the medical community in general needs to work on that and to get an increase the awareness of that. Uh, there is a question by Pritcha. Are certain ethnic groups more disposed to the effects of EDC? I have no information on that. The question is, for example, uh, having more insulin resistance like Pacific Island or South Asians. I cannot really answer the question. I would like maybe that Angel Nadal, maybe later on after his talk comes back to this question. The next question is, do we have any resource to look at the list of EDCs and their effect on human being? Good question, important question. Yes, we have. If you go to the website of ECHA, the European Chemicals Agency, you will find a lot of this information there. You can look for chemicals in general and then specify on endocrine disrupting chemicals and there you can find a lot of your information. And um, I would again come back to the uh, human biomonitoring for EU. They have a beautiful database, a beautiful website. They give a monthly newsletter on their results coming out of the research in Europe over the last 20 years on chemical exposure, not only endocrine disruptors, but chemical exposure. So there you find a lot of presentation material, handout, updates, on what has been new findings. So I think with, uh, with the HMB for you website, there you might have um, a good source to get more information. Paula Soares asks, which mechanisms can be involved in transgenerational effects? Oh yes, a very tough question. Again, I would say I would like to to transfer these answers on uh, also to the next speakers. What we know is we have definite uh, mechanistic insight 
that the chromatin structure will be changed by either changing the histone or the methylation status or both. That is one way. And obviously the, um, the chromatin packaging will have impact then on uh, what is reading. An example why such things probably are happening come, might come from twin studies. And I think our pediatric colleagues today and tomorrow will, might comment on that because we have situations that monozygotic twins might have different outcomes in metabolic diseases or in other endocrine system. So the methylation, demethylation, real uh, chromatin, let's say, uh, modification after birth, after the fertilization process is open for such influences. But probably much research is needed. How much will that bring in the, in the human? And always the question, when there can be transgenerational effects, will there be at one point also positive transgenerational effects? I have no idea whether that would happen or are we only talking on negative ones? Uh, another question, would it be fair to say that those consuming meat, fish are more predisposed to adverse effects? Um, sorry. Uh, due to microplastic in, in ingestion via meat products and fish. Uh, important question. Since I'm working on the thyroid field, I have a specific opinion on it. We know that the thyroid system is very much dependent on iodine and the thyroid hormone system is very much dependent on selenium. And you can protect your thyroid hormone system by having an adequate iodine and selenium status. And if you have an adequate iodine status and an adequate selenium status, you will be kind of safer, safer, not safe, against adverse effects of endocrine disrupting compounds, chemicals affecting the thyroid. But I cannot talk about the plastic, microplastic ingestion because that is tremendously increasing currently. And since you have this uh, microplastic, um, let's say exposure, there is the potential of leaking and leakiness of the, of the um, microplastics and endocrine disruptor compounds. So in general, I would say, yes, we have to strongly and heavily work on the microplastics plastic issue. And you have seen that currently in Paris is a conference coming up. And I hope and wish that this weekend in Paris will really make a big breakthrough to fight the plastic pollution of our planet. But we have to wait what our politicians really will decide. Uh, there is a question impact on EDCs on longevity? I cannot answer this question. I'm not aware of any data whether this will be positive or negative. I have to say, I do not know. Uh, do we have some clinical testing resource to check if a certain patient's disease is produced by any disruptor? A uh, very difficult question. I would be careful at this point, since we cannot really say on clear cause effect relationships, we can only say, yes, there is an exposure. There is a higher exposure than on average in the population. But since we have no, almost no negative controls anymore, as I mentioned, there is no body on, on the planet which is not exposed anymore, it will be very difficult to have the yes and no answer. So there is some evidence that, and this will be presented in other talks, um, and you find literature about that, that there is a relationship, an association between us exposure in the uh, during development, exposure postnatally, and the uh, increased risk or hazard on both for various diseases. And when we take our basic research in in vitro and in animal experimental model series, where we can really study cause effect relationship, I dare, 
as a basic scientist with translational orientation to extrapolate that what we see in many animal models in vitro will probably be found also in the human system. So I'm quite positive that there is something and not only assumptions. But clinical testing, I think you can spend a lot of money on that. You can uh, contact various agencies or companies or private or authorities. You will get a mixture, you will get data, but it will be very difficult to say then in a specific individual that this exposure is really causing something. The, what we can see is that it's contributing, that it's a confounding factor that is probably contributing to the adversity. I think we are running out of time for this slot or are we, how are we doing? Yeah, it's probably time to move on now. Okay. Then I think I would like to stop the um, discussion here. Uh, thanks for the compliments. I, I know it's difficult to get an introduction for a session, but you will now get more details, more specifics by our next speaker. And I would like to invite Professor Angel Nadal from uh, the Miguel Hernandez University uh, in Spain. And he is really one of the pioneers of endocrine disrupting research in metabolism, especially the uh, beta cell, the uh, uh, pancreatic island. And Angel Nadal will now give you uh, really a detailed insight into how do endocrine disruptors upset our metabolic system. Angel, please. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for this introduction. And, uh, and I want to thank also the European Society of Endocrinology for inviting me and give me, giving me the opportunity to talk to, to you today about how uh, do endocrine disruptors upset our metabolic system. Well, in, in our unit, uh, 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 related to diabetes at, at Miguel Hernandez University in Alicante, Spain, we, we work really to understand how the environment influences glucose homeostasis. And our ultimate aim is actually to translate this knowledge into actions to decrease the prevalence of diabetes and, and related metabolic disorders. And, and this is why really the figures related to diabetes are, are alarming, are really very worrying. Uh, 537 million people in the world has diabetes at this very moment. And which is uh, more worrying is that uh, diabetes is, is starting at very younger age uh, each time. So now, now we have even teenagers becoming uh, type two diabetes. And in addition to that, uh, more than 500 million adults in the world has problems with glucose regulation. And they are uh, very likely uh, to, to become type two diabetics in, in the near future. Uh, and diabetes kills people. Uh, one person dies of diabetes and his consequences every five seconds in, in the world. And it's affecting mostly low and middle income countries. And the 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 budget, uh, I mean, the, 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 the amount of euros we, we pay for that and every, every country pays for that is, is really huge. So this is what is spent in healthcare in, in, uh, 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 related to diabetes. And this is the increase in the last 15 years for healthcare spending is more than 300%. Uh, and I think this is just unsustainable for the suffering of people and also for the economy of uh, countries. And we have to do something. So how type two diabetes happens, which is the, the most numerous uh, uh, diabetic type in, in, indeed in the world? Well, it happens because there is an induction of insulin resistance together with a decrease of beta cell function, that is production and release of insulin, together 
with a decrease in the pancreatic beta cell mass. So the beta cell uh, dies with, with uh, time and with the genetic predisposition and the environmental factors that are the key players in these two variables here to have type 2 diabetes. So uh, we are focused on the environmental factors. The environment is very complex and all these items here are going to affect uh, uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity as well, and they all interact. So it's, it's a very complex situation. But uh, of course, what is important for, for us and here today are environmental chemicals, and particularly among environmental chemicals, uh, endocrine disruptors, and how they can affect uh, our metabolism. Well, there are numerous epidemiological data already linking and associating EDCs with obesity and or diabetes. And you can go to this statement that we published seven years ago, uh, and, and see some of these studies. In these seven years, they have uh, other studies that have been published relating EDCs with obesity, diabetes, and other metabolic uh, disorders that are associated. And even there are some longitudinal studies now that have been published recently, as these two are, are two important ones describing how the exposure to bisphenol A is related to uh, the disruption of glucose homeostasis and also is associated with the incident of type 2 diabetes. So it seems that uh, exposure to EDCs can be a problem for obesity and diabetes. And these uh, are the main endocrine disruptors that have been related to to these two metabolic disorders, bisphenol, phthalates, pesticides, uh, uh, including uh, DDT and, and his metabolism, DDE, organotins, PFAS, dioxins, and, and other persistent organic pollutants, and, and also heavy metals. All of them are related to diabetes, and, and we have some mechanistic understanding as well, as we're going to see. So each of these endocrine disruptors is going to produce a different phenotype in animal experiments. And the phenotype is going to depend on the endocrine disruptor and is going to depend as well on exposure levels in humans or dosage on animal models. It's going to depend on the timing of exposure and it's going to depend on sex and age as well. So it is very difficult to predict a phenotype actually. So how uh, these EDCs can produce uh, diabetes, for instance. So we know that uh, the main risk factor for diabetes is obesity. And we know that obesity produces insulin resistance, uh, mainly in these three tissues here, the liver, the adipocytes, and the skeletal muscle. And at the same time, it increases pancreatic beta cell function and mass to counteract the insulin resistance. And with a number of years, this uh, adaptation of the pancreatic beta cell disappears and then type 2 diabetes appears. And so EDCs can produce diabetes because they produce obesity and therefore are a risk factor for, uh, for diabetes as well. How EDCs can produce obesity? This is, is, is not an easy question to answer. As we can see here, this is the energy balance equation. Energy storage equals energy input minus energy output. And if we change any of these items here, the other two are going to change accordingly. And this is something very important. So we are all exposed to a cocktail of endocrine disruptors. And we know that these endocrine disruptors affect all the different tissues involved in the energy balance equation. These have been proved. And very likely, the exposure to this cocktail is going to affect many different tissue, uh, tissues at the very same time. Okay, so that's uh, something important. And 
three of these uh, tissues are the most studied, the white adipose tissue, the liver, and the pancreas. Also, brown adipose tissue have been very well studied and the thyroid as well. The thyroid not so related to metabolism, but I'm going to focus here today on the white adipose tissue, the liver, and the pancreas that are the most studied. And let's start by the white adipose tissue. So all these chemicals here have been associated with uh, different effects in animal studies and in cellular studies. And they can change the fate of mesenchymal stem cells to preadipocytes. They can increase adipocyte proliferation, so producing hyperplastic adipocytes, and they can increase lipid uptake in vivo and in vitro as well, producing hypertrophic adipocytes. And we know the mechanism for some of them, for, for instance, for for BPA and other bisphenols or sinoestrogen, PCBs and dioxins and uh, tributyl teen and are binding to nuclear receptors at the low doses, producing the alteration of gene expression. And this, in addition to what I said before, is also going to alter the function of the adipocyte, producing uh, insulin resistance, a decrease in the release of adiponectin regularly, uh, an increase in the uh, release of leptin, and also an increase in, in the production and release of interleukin-6, TNF, uh, and INF, uh, or interferon gamma uh, 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 factors related to inflammation and, and insulin resistance in the adipocytes. So what happens in the hepatocytes well, is, is uh, something very similar. All these chemicals here affect uh, the targets in the adipocytes. In the nucleus, they change the expression of genes uh, related to uh, fatty acid synthesis, fatty acid efflux, uh, increasing fatty, the, the, the mechanisms that increase the fatty acid uptake, and changing fatty acid oxidation and producing mitochondrial dysfunction and ER stress. So, and this uh, is produced in some cases, as you can see here, also by uh, 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 involving different nuclear receptors, depending on, uh, on, on, on the endocrine disruptor uh, that is studied. And, and I want to remind that we are exposed to a cocktail of, of them. So we are exposed to most of the ones that we see here. And now the pancreatic beta itself. So all this list of endocrine disruptors affect how the pancreatic beta cell works, either altering uh, 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 the mitochondrial function and increasing ATP or decreasing ATP ADP ratio, modifying the ion channel expression and function, and therefore changing calcium influx, and in that way modifying insulin release as well as insulin production and other gene expression related to the fate of, of beta cell, related to cell death and to cell division. And in some cases, as, as bisphenol, PCBs or dioxines, as well as organotins, we know that they bind to estrogen receptors or to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor to modify gene expression or to regulate glucose transport and to regulate insulin release as well. And the effect can be rather different. In the case of bisphenol, for instance, they produce normally a, a hyperinsulinemia, a, a release of, of insulin uh, exacerbated. And in the case of PCBs or dioxine, dioxins uh, are all the opposite. They produce an hyperinsulinemia and decrease glucose stimulated insulin secretion. And so the effect in beta cell was particularly interesting for us because we studied diabetes and the fact of having a direct effect in, in beta cell is per se a, a factor that can increase the risk of becoming diabetic. So in addition to EDCs producing obesity, EDCs can induce the same effect as obesity. So we know that EDCs 
some of them produce insulin resistance as well, and they disrupt beta cell function, even in the absence of obesity. And if we combine both together, then we have the perfect storm for metabolic disorders. So it has been well studied and, and demonstrated that, for instance, in adult male mice, the exposure to bisphenols, particularly bisphenol A or phthalates, gives a, a phenotype in a matter of one week to eight weeks of treatment. And the phenotype is, in general, insulin resistant, this lipidemia, hyperinsulinemia, and glucose intolerance uh, with different effects at the molecular level that I'm not going to enter here in the skeletal muscle and deposites and, and in the liver and also in the beta cell. And there is no change in weight in these animals. And the phenotype is particularly produced in males, not so much in females. And in this other paradigm, uh, is, is maternal exposure to BPA during pregnancy or pregnancy and lactation. And the phenotype is normally with a mild or no weight gain and having a hyperinsulinemia, hyperleptinemia, decrease in adiponectin in serum, increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, impaired glucose tolerance, insulin resistance, and this lipidemia. And that happens normally after four months. From four months to six months, there is no phenotype before or or, or no very marked phenotype and start happening at four months of age. And particularly in males in the case of bisphenol A exposure that has been well studied. It's not the same uh, as it appears with, with other endocrine disruptors that sometimes is, is in, in, in females. So it's very dependent on sex and age. And as you can see here, there is uh, uh, changes in, in the function and in the gene expression of pancreatic beta cells as well. And in general, the changes in the pancreatic beta cells in adult males or in the offsprings of mother treated uh, uh, during pregnancy uh, produce a, a, a changes in, in the pancreatic beta cell that are very similar to what is called the mild nutriestress. The mild nutriestress is like when we are overweight. When we are overweight, the pancreatic beta cells is a higher glucose in plasma, higher fatty acids in plasma, and then that produces a situation in which the electrical activity is changed. There is an increase in calcium in metabolism coupling factors, increase in insulin synthesis and in the in, uh, gene expression of, of these important genes here, producing an increase in glucose stimulated insulin secretion. Uh, and this is normally what is called the mild nutrient stress during overweight and even obesity. And in this particular case, bisphenol or phthalates, they uh, act exactly on the same biochemical pathways as the nutrient stress. Okay, so they alter mitochondrial function, they change the expression of the electrical activity, they change calcium signaling, this we don't know very much. They change insulin synthesis, bisphenol increase insulin synthesis, phthalates decrease insulin synthesis, and the same with, with these uh, genes, and increase, other decrease, and normally there is ER stress associated, and with all the EDCs uh, up to now, an increase in apoptosis, and the change in insulin release depends on the EDC, bisphenol, for instance, increase glucose stimulated insulin secretion, phthalates decrease glucose stimulated insulin secretion. The point is that the very same pathways are affected. So, and if we have mild nutrient stress together with the exposure to endocrine disruptors, uh, the problem is, is worse. So to summarize what, uh, I think the situation is, is now with the, the metabolic diseases is that we, we have data in human cohorts associating and with some longitudinal studies already, an increase in diabetes and an increase in obesity with the increase 
in EDC's exposure. And the causality is normally found in animal experiments where it's clear association, uh, sorry, it's clear causation of obesity or insulin resistance, decrease in plasma insulin levels and other important hormones and alterations in the pancreatic beta cells uh, and that normally are associated with obesity and sometimes are cause of the obesity and diabetes or the opposite. This is always very difficult to figure out. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Angel, for this very clear, very concise, and in contrast to my presentation, in time. Excellent. <laughs> so we have time thank for you. discussions. Any questions? Maybe uh, you can uh, give a comment to the previous question. Do you have any evidence that certain ethnic groups might be more dis uh, predisposed to EDC effects in terms of insulin resistance. Do we have any data on that? Uh, as far as I know, I, I think this is a very interesting present, uh, uh, question, actually. Uh, as far as I know, I, I, I'm not aware of a study uh, done in humans related to that. Uh, but certainly, diabetes and obesity are a gene by environment interaction. And this is something that is missing. And, and something that needs to be done also in, in, in animal studies. Uh, uh, so in animals, there are some studies in which animals predispose to diabetes, that, such as Tukushima fatty uh, uh, rats. Uh, you know, they have a, an onset of diabetes before if they have been exposed to EDCs. But uh, I, I, I'm not aware in humans, but it's something to, to, to do. Yeah. In in the context of this uh, question, also uh, also by um, uh, Precha, do we have any specific genetic polymorphisms predisposing in a human? Can we say anything already? Uh, I I think uh, mm, well, in the human is always difficult. <laughs> in um, I mean, we, we, we know there are like 200 different genes involved in diabetes and also yeah. in obesity as well, uh, that they all give a small percentage. And we don't know the relationship with EDC's exposure, which one of them is changing more or less expression, you know? This is not known in, in, in humans. There is a very recent study uh, from Victor Corthes in PNAS paper in 2022 in December, uh, showing the changes in mice of FTO, which is, is, is a key gene in, in obesity, of course, and how this is transgenerational up to the sixth generation. Okay. Uh, very concerning. Yeah. So that's concerning, but I cannot comment no. farther than that. Uh, no. um, there is one question. Um, about the dosage and exposure of uh, bisphenol A and phthalate. Um, can you give an idea on at which level it is relevant in a human? You, you have data, very clear data in your rodent models. Can hmm. we extrapolate anything? Well, we, we know that in humans, low doses can affect the pancreas. Uh, I mean, we did a study in humans uh, by measuring insulin levels and glucose after one shot of, of BPA, uh, 50 micrograms per kilo, or only one, so to avoid any, any problem, and measuring this acute exposure, and we saw the changes in, in glucose and, and insulin levels. So we know that a low dose uh, can produce an effect in the pancreas. We don't know if probably just one shot is not deleterious, very likely. So we don't know further than that in humans, of course. We, we know in human cells, concentrations like the ones we have in blood yep. clearly affect uh, human cells involved in, both, in both metabolism. Yep. Would, would you agree with the, with the statement of the human biomonitoring for EU studies that at least for some of the phthalates, some of the bisphenol A, they are really reaching the exposure data, health relevant levels? 
Mm. Fully agree. Fully agree. We, we, we see, and I mean, we don't work with talates, but other groups have, have shown, uh, and, and we work with vicinal, and we, we see regularly in animals and in human cells in vitro effects at, at the, the levels we, 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 I mean, they're measuring in, in this project. Okay. Um, the previous question from Paolo's, uh, Paola Soares. Um, transgenerational effects, any other mechanism than those of chromatin mod modification on your side, which you would like to add? I, I don't know any other. I think the most solid uh, uh, work at the moment for the mechanism of transgenerational mechanism is the one done by Bruce Blamber, the University of California, Irvine. And what they ha are showing is a, a, a change in the architecture of, of the chromatin, which is preserved up to the fourth generation. And that can explain uh, uh, why the, uh, the, the, the methylations, et cetera, that are normally clean after one uh, uh, you know, generation to the other, uh, yeah. that really the, this change in the architecture can can yeah. stay, but but not the the the, the marks, the chemical marks. So, uh, I mean, I'm not, not a specialist on that, but I think at the more solid yeah. uh, experiment. Uh, one question I mentioned that there might be protective effects, for example, of uh, iodide and selenium for the thyroid hormone system. Do you know of any potential protective effects on the metabolic system, diabetes? Uh, I think soy has been proposed. Uh, and there is a, a paper shown in mice by um, Girtel Laboratory uh, in PNIS in 2007, showing that at several others after that uh, somehow can protect, uh, at least from epigenetic marks. Uh, but okay. no many more yeah. papers on that. Good. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have more yeah. questions than time for uh, things, so I don't want I know. to be unfair to the next speakers. So no, we, me neither. We will keep these questions and then I would like to thank you very much for this uh, really excellent presentation, Angel. And uh, we continue with thank the next you, uh, speaker. And this is Alexandra Buha. She's uh, assistant professor of toxicology at the University of Belgrade. She's also a member of the EDC working group and uh, active in the focus area. And Alexandra now will give us some uh, data and information on endocrine disruptors and reproductive health, new findings from cohort and animal studies. Alexandra, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my great uh, honor and pleasure today to share the results of my research group. Uh, this is the work that we have been doing in the previous two years. And I'm going to speak about the role of uh, toxic metals in reproductive health. And I will show you some data that we got uh, from human and animal studies. So uh, infertility is nowadays considered to be a worldwide public health issue. We can say this uh, easily. And uh, uh, it has been said that among 15% uh, uh, of cap, uh, there is a, a, a stats that show us that there is a 15% of all reproductive age couples uh, that are being affected uh, by these effects. And among them, uh, male factors accounts for uh, about uh, 40 percentage of all uh, reported infertility cases. And there are also data that show us that estrogen dependent uh, disorders are generally on rise nowadays. Uh, this is the paper that uh, really uh, kind of resonates uh, in my uh, mind uh, when I, uh, after I have uh, read it. Uh, this paper clearly shows that uh, there is a, a, a clear uh, trend of uh, uh, dec decline in sperm count globally. And uh, this is the sentence which uh, uh, kind of sums up the work of these uh, authors. And it says that data suggests that this worldwide decline is, con is continuing in the, 30, uh, in the 21st century at an accelerated pace. 
and that the research on the causes of these continuing decline and actions to prevent further disruption of male reproductive health, health are urgently needed. Uh, so this is very uh, a serious problem that we need to deal with and the reasons uh, for this uh, sperm count are many and we have to account environmental exposures among these and especially exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, I think that Professor Kerle kind of explained the, the reasons why endocrine disrupting chemicals are so important and why endocrine disrupting chemicals are so different from the other chemicals. So they're uh, everywhere. We are exposed to them at our uh, uh, daily basis, and they have this uh, really uh, uh, specific dose response behavior. Uh, as a toxicologist, uh, I'm uh, more used to this monotonic curve and the ability to have the threshold or to uh, define the dose after uh, below which is uh, uh, exposure is considered to be safe. But when it comes to endocrine disrupting chemicals, we are facing a lot of behavior uh, of dose response curves, which is non-monotonic. So in this case, we cannot actually uh, uh, truly uh, predict the, the uh, behavior of the endocrine disrupting chemical in our organism based on the toxicological studies on animals, which are mainly uh, done with very high dosages, the dosages which are not the dosages to which we are exposed to. Uh, we have also talked a lot about transgenerational and delayed effects, and this is, I think, uh, a big problem and a big concern to all uh, pregnant women because they are not only responsible for their uh, uh, children, but they are also responsible for the uh, health of their grandchildren and even grand-grandchildren. And of course, in our real life uh, scenarios, we are never exposed to one chemical. We are always exposed to mixtures and these mixtures, and uh, I mean, the substances in the mixture, they can uh, of course interact among each other and they can produce uh, even uh, uh, higher and more uh, uh, pronounced effects than we could anticipate based on the addition. Uh, so, uh, my research group uh, in uh, uh, recent time uh, has mainly been focused on toxic metals. Uh, we are exposed to toxic metals by a variety of sources, uh, through the food we eat, through the air we breathe, through the water we drink. Uh, toxic metals are naturally present in our uh, uh, planet, but we are also uh, raising the level of these toxic metals by various anthropogenic uh, activities and uh, therefore sources of these chem uh, chemicals are everywhere. So uh, researches into occupational exposure of metals are many and they show that toxic metals can have uh, various uh, consequences to the reproductive system, reproductive health uh, uh, of both uh, uh, women and men. And and uh, uh, we have also done some studies uh, concerning the role of these toxic metals in uh, some uh, specific cancer, like cancers like uh, prostatic cancer, testis cancer, uh, breast cancer. And for example, we have found uh, the, the uh, evidences that uh, levels of uh, certain toxic metals such as cadmium and lead are higher, for example, in the cancerous breast tissue than in the healthy breast tissue. And this might point to their role in these uh, 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 diseases as well. Uh, of course, we also have a lot of uh, experimental data that uh, really shows the, the effect of these metals on our uh, reproductive system uh, in both uh, female and in both uh, male uh, rats and uh, other animal models. And uh, I'm going back to the toxicology of mixtures again and the, toxico and the importance of testing the, uh, the low doses because as we have talk, uh, as uh, uh, we have already said, these uh, studies, which are based on high dose regimen, are not actually uh, telling us uh, uh, necessary information because we are talking about endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals. So therefore, uh, there is a high demand of uh, testing the real life exposure scenarios. So this is something that we have tried to do through this research. Uh, so the aim of this project was to investigate the levels of uh, certain toxic metals. We have decided to investigate cadmium, mercury, nickel, chromium, lead, and arsenic. 
And we wanted to test the levels of these metals in a general population. And then we wanted to test the dose response relationship between these metals and uh, hormone, uh, various hormone levels by using the benchmark dose approach in both female and male population. Uh, so we didn't want to uh, just uh, determine the correlation because it uh, correlation does not necessarily mean causality, but we wanted to see whether there is a dose response uh, relationship between these chemicals levels and the hormone levels. And based on this, to find safety, so-called safety doses, and uh, to figure out whether these doses, which are uh, uh, probably, uh, that is something that we assumed, are very low, uh, whether these doses in combination will give some effects in uh, animals. So we decided to uh, uh, examine the effects of mixtures of these toxic metals and uh, arsenic on female and male endocrine function after the exposure to real life dose levels in animal models. And uh, by doing uh, so, uh, we also take into account the uh, uh, differences between uh, 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 sexes. So uh, this was the methodology when it comes to human study. Uh, so we had uh, 435 subjects which participated in this study, and out of uh, this uh, uh, number, uh, 183 subjects were healthy, uh, healthy participants, and 252 subjects suffered from different diseases. Some of them uh, suffered from cancer, some of them suffered from various uh, endocrine disorders. Uh, and we had uh, 2,080 women and 2,070 uh, men. Uh, we collected uh, the subject's blood uh, after uh, 20 hours of testing, and we measured the levels of uh, uh, already mentioned metals and uh, uh, arsenic uh, by using these two different methods. And also we have uh, investigated the levels of certain hormones in uh, the collected serum. So what we did with this uh, collected data was to, uh, just a second, yes, to determine, uh, I've already mentioned that we wanted to determine the dose response relationship. And uh, for doing this, we decided to use the benchmark dose concept. So let me just tell you a little bit more about this concept. So this benchmark dose modeling uh, is basically uh, created uh, as a manner of fine tuning to estimate the point of departure or uh, so-called safe dose. And this method is suggested by uh, uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency and also by European uh, Food Safety Agency as a viable tool, tool for determining the, the uh, reference doses. Uh, so uh, the benchmark dose is basically uh, um, defined as a dose which uh, corresponds to a particular change. It can be a 5% per, uh, change or 10% change. It depends on the uh, type of the uh, response you are uh, 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 trying to, to, uh, to connect with the levels of the chemical. And uh, uh, in this particular case, uh, we have uh, decided to analyze uh, hormone levels as quantal individual data. And uh, the benchmark response that we were trying to uh, uh, determine was the 10 percentage extra risk. So the levels which we obtained for the doses uh, were basically the doses that are going to be responsible to, for the 10 percentage extra risk of having a certain hormone outside the reference dose, uh, uh, reference range, sorry. So uh, by, uh, if you have the, this amount of uh, metal in your organism, this may basically mean that you have 10 percentage extra risk of uh, having your hormone, for example, testosterone or some other hormone outside the reference uh, range. So these are the results of our uh, human biomonitoring uh, study. Uh, these are uh, this, this, uh, these are the papers that we have published and uh, that have. Uh, 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 results of this study, uh, which uh, are uh, basically uh, concerned with the levels of uh, reproductive hormones in both men and women. So here are the results, and this is how this benchmark dose modeling actually looks like and uh, how it uh, actually uh, 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 should be interpreted. 
So we have these uh, intervals and uh, as you can see, I have uh, marked the inter intervals which were narrow. So the, this is very important to get the narrow interval. Otherwise, you're not sure. Uh, I mean, having this wide interval doesn't tell you a lot. But uh, for example, in this case, the uh, connection between the cadmium and testosterone doses. So somewhere between these two values is the value of cadmium, which is going to produce the 10 percentage extra risk of having your testosterone levels outside the reference range. And this is especially concerning if you look at the levels of cadmium that we have measured in the sample of our general population. So as you can see, we have measured 1.96, so it is inside this range. And we have also measured the, uh, the similar levels uh, for men. So uh, uh, these were the, the conclusions of this part of the study. So we have found the dose response relationship be between all measured metals and hormones. And we have found the narrowest intervals uh, for cadmium and testosterone and mercury and luteinizing hormone pairs. And uh, what was uh, really uh, uh, important is that measured medians for cadmium and mercury were within the calculated benchmark doses intervals. And this kind of uh, tells us that further studies on the role of toxic metals in male reproductive toxicity are warranted. Uh, similar was when we were uh, exploring the, the role of toxic metals and female reproduction, we have also found some very narrow intervals and uh, some levels of, for example, arsenite, which were even outside these intervals. So we can say that the general population, the women were under the uh, 10 percentage extra risk of having, for example, their testosterone levels outside the reference range. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, what we have uh, uh, discussed later on, and it's the importance of uh, utilizing uh, these uh, uh, precise doses that we have uh, uh, obtained uh, through this uh, human uh, study and uh, 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 analyze uh, their effects on the animal model in experimental and control uh, uh, environment. So this, is, this was the uh, next step. So we uh, investigated these uh, uh, metal mixtures on the animal levels. So we decided to do two studies. One was 28 uh, days long, the other one's 90 days long. And we wanted to see uh, what is going to happen with a group that is going to be tested with very, very low doses. These were the benchmark doses uh, for the each metal. So the mixture contained the, the levels of each metal in the uh, corresponding to the benchmark doses that we have calculated. Uh, we have also, uh, by using reverse dosimetry, we have transferred the concentration, median concentration in female and male population of uh, Republic of Serbia into uh, doses for the animal, uh, both uh, female and male animals. And we have also used the 90, uh, 95th percentile, so the, the uh, part of the population which was uh, more uh, exposed to these metals. And we have tested this F4 and M4 group was actually the NOAA levels, so no observable adverse effect levels, uh, levels which are currently uh, considered to be safe. Uh, so uh, uh, after the 28 and 90 days, we have uh, uh, collected the blood samples and we have analyzed these uh, 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 levels of, of certain hormones. I have to say that this uh, is still work in progress, so I will just give you a brief uh, uh, look at the, uh, some of the results that we have obtained. So, for example, uh, regarding the female rats, we have obtained the... Uh, Statistically significant levels of uh, uh, statistically significant changes in levels of luteinizing hormone, for example, in these two groups, the group that uh, represented 95th percentile, and also in this uh, F4 group, which, as you remember, as you probably remember, represents the null values, so the values which are considered to be safe. And here, for example, for the follicle stimulating hormone, you can basically see the non-monotonic response here. So something happened here with the lowest doses, with a mixture of the lowest doses. Uh, for example, for the testosterone, we didn't get any significantly, uh, 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 statistically significant changes, for example, uh, in, in uh, all groups. 
So uh, to conclude, uh, the obtained data from both human and animal studies reveal possible effects of toxic metalloids on uh, environmental levels on uh, uh, endocrine function homeostasis in both females and males. And the mechanistic story behind these effects, we are hoping to, to have a, a better look inside uh, it uh, by doing various tests, uh, which is also a work in progress at this point. So I would like to thank to, uh, my team for uh, uh, doing this uh, 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 huge amount of work uh, from both uh, human biomonitoring and the animal study. And I would like to thank uh, the Science, Science Fund of Republic of Serbia for financing this project. Yeah, thank you very much, Alexandra, for presenting this uh, real human and animal data on the metal interference uh, and metal mixture interference. Um, I would like to ask, uh, if possible, to our our attendees, stay tuned for the last talk. Uh, so this will be even more interesting uh, from the pediatric point of view. Don't uh, leave already if you have some time. And then I would like to ask for some questions uh, specifically to Alexandra. Um, maybe one question at the beginning. There is always the issue, uh, is this a unidirectional action that the endocrine system is influencing the rest of the system or the rest of the toxicology is influencing the endocrine system? Can you say in which way or is there a balance? Uh, yes, uh, great question. Uh, well, as I have uh, uh, told you, the, the mechanistic part of this story is still unrevealed. So we are still doing a lot of analysis, uh, both histopathological analysis, oxidative stress analysis. So we are trying to determine what actually happened, whether these were the direct effect on the glands or uh, some other organs were uh, uh, influenced by these uh, uh, mixtures. And hence, we have uh, had these and uh, noticed these changes in the, in the hormone levels. OK. Um a question also from the last session is still valid here. Do you have any advice or evidence published that um, there is some protective possibility against this combined metal exposure in the terms of the endocrine disruption effects? Yeah, well, when it comes to exposure to metals, uh, it is hard to talk about uh, the right protection. I think that uh, as you have uh, told us in your slide, the prevention is very important and the prevention consists of two steps. The first one is better regulation. The second one is uh, leading a healthier lifestyle and uh, uh, you know, trying to, to be less exposed to, to these toxic metals. And I was uh, talking about exposure through food. So the general advice would be to have a healthy balanced diet. So to, to, to make sure to, to include various uh, types of food in your uh, uh, diet. Yeah, there was um, another question from the previous session uh, addressing the cosmetic products which contain mm -hmm. endocrine disrupting compounds, but all some of them also contain metals. Do you have any specific, let's say, comments on the on the cosmetic or or let's say body care products in terms of metals in the context of endocrine disruption? Yeah, well, uh, I think that when it comes to cosmetics. Uh, uh, the bigger issue is uh, con uh, is connected with uh, exposure to, for example, bis bisphenols or PFAS and other types of chemicals. But I really uh, do believe that with this uh, stricter regulations, uh, which is going to happen very soon, uh, we will be more protected uh, from uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals in the future. So we need to really motivate our regulatory authorities, our politicians, yeah, our society to be more on the preventive side and not only to act when it's too late, when there is already damage. Uh, Leonid yes. Astuntas had a question, maybe uh, you can uh, partially answer it. There are many comorbidities because in your group, you had the healthy individuals and you had the uh, diseased individuals. Is there yes. any specific point which say um, that the toxicity of metals or endocrine disrupting compounds is specifically enhanced by these comorbidities or any 
type of comorbidity. He mentions, let's say, vitamin B12, for example. Yeah, I don't have uh, uh, our data particular on this matter, but I would say that our response to a certain chemical certainly depends on the uh, state of our organism as well as our genetics predisposition. So uh, there are no two people who are going to react the same way when they're exposed to the same levels of chem uh, chemicals, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I guess that the state of the organism will certainly affect the absorption of metals, for example. So if the state of the organism, if we already have some comorbidities, I suppose that we will be more exposed and more metals will be uh, present in our body. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Alexandra, for thank this you. important in, uh, and clear presentation. And last but not least, sorry, uh, uh, Stefano, for taking too much of your time away before um, the next speaker will be Stefano Gianfarani from the University of Rome. He's a pediatric endocrinologist and um, diabetologist, and we are happy that we see the pediatric side represented here on the joint activity of ASC and the ESPE European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology. The floor is up to you and stay tuned until we have this last session. Sorry for the delay. Thank you, Josef. I hope you can uh, see the, the picture and uh, hear me quite well. Yes, Fine? everything's okay. Very good. Okay, so uh, let's start just reminding you, we have already learned to know that there are so many routes in which we are exposed to different endocrine disruptors, uh, food, soil, water, that's uh, just to uh, sum up the main routes. Uh, but uh, in children, uh, in pediatric age, there are other routes. You see that the maternal fetus unit is particularly exposed to different kinds of endocrine disruptors. We have the dermal exposure to cosmetics, for example, you had just talked about that, inhalation uh, exposure, uh, but uh, of course, oral exposure with food contaminants or plasticizers. But uh, the important thing to, to remember is that actually there is a, a possible accumulation of these lipophilic chemicals, uh, especially in the milk. So breast milk can be one of the routes uh, used by uh, endocrine disruptors to uh, reach the, uh, the baby, the newborns. And at the same time, we also have a possible transfer uh, through the placenta from mother to fetus of many different uh, endocrine disruptors. So I would say that actually children, uh, Josef already uh, mentioned that at the beginning of this webinar, uh, children and uh, newborns, infants and fetus as well, as particularly exposed to endocrine disruptors. And if we uh, uh, take into account the developmental origin of adult disease, uh, so this means that a programming in utero can affect the, the health of the subject uh, throughout all the lifespan. Actually, it is very important to uh, try to understand which kind of exposure, which kind of chemicals are more you know, hazards are more dangerous for the uh, fetus and the child. Uh, this is a, um, just to give you an idea, uh, 54 different pregnant women in a subgroup of Nanes uh, court in which actually uh, the different endocrine disruptors were measured. And you see that so different kind of um, endocrine disruptors, including PBDEs, metals, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, pesticides, phthalates, are found in all pregnant women. So all these pregnant women uh, actually are at risk of uh, transferring the, uh, these endocrine disruptors to the fetus. Children are more exposed to uh, endocrine disruptors than adults. Why? First of all, because they have a low metabolic capacity, then they uh, have a higher consumption of water and food. Then they have a higher inhalation rate per unit body mass than adults, higher intestinal absorption, frequent object to mouth and head to mouth uh, activity, especially, you know, toddlers, thinner skin than adults, and a greater skin surface area per unit body weight, which can result in higher dermal permeation and exposure to toxicants. So, I would say that children actually are a target 
of um, the vast majority of endocrine disruptors and are much more uh, you know, uh, exposed to these uh, potential uh, disrupting chemicals than adults. And to give you a, a picture about that, you see this comparison between uh, infant and adult exposure to PFOS and P4. And you see that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, infants, you see the amount of uh, exposure, amount of these chemicals in, uh, uh, in uh, biological samples is so much higher than this, the same chemicals found in adult uh, biological samples. And another important and interesting thing is that you see here that the vast majority of these chemicals actually uh, come from breast milk, breast feeding. And this was also quite uh, recently confirmed in a, in a Rotterdam study showing that breast uh, milk, breast feeding is one of the major routes for uh, contamination of uh, infants. Um, in, the, in that case, PFAS, where the endocrine disruptors actually identified in uh, breast milk. But uh, once again, uh, looking at the potential uh, programming um, in which specific time windows actually are more susceptible to the disruptor, disrupting action of chemicals, you see that it's very important to, to know the different stage of development of the fetus, because uh, when the, uh, the body, I mean the fetus, uh, the fetus is exposed to specific chemicals in specific time windows, then the final effects in postnatal life, uh, also in adult life, will be different. I have just highlighted the productive system because one of the major, I mean, I would say the more robust um, uh, evidence is about the exposure to pesticide and the later development of uh, this, this, uh, or testicular disrupting syndrome. You see here um, in this uh, uh, slide that the, uh, according to different stages of development, the impact of the exposure to different endocrine disruptors can be uh, specific for a specific uh, uh, system, for a specific tissue. You see quite uh, early uh, in exposure, for example, to pesticide or PFAS of phthalates or phenols have a big impact on a brain. Later on, we will have an impact on a kidney function, then on reproductive uh, system, then on respiratory system. And later on in postnatal life in adolescence, actually, uh, we already talked about the obeso obesogens, uh, including PFAS, phthalates, and phenols. So according to different uh, time windows in the lifespan, the final effect could be different and the final uh, target, the tissue target can be different. But one more thing I would like to draw your attention on is that actually there are some major players which are PFAS, phthalates and phenols, uh, who are, which are present in all, you see, stages of development. So I would say the, these three different um, uh, class of, uh, classes of substances, of endocrine disruptors, can play a major role in, a, in affecting the final uh, development of different tissues if we are exposed during our fetal life. This is just to give you an idea of what's happening in Italy. We um, recently performed a biomonitoring um, survey in Italy, according to the North, Central, or South regions of the country, and also subdividing the exposure in rural and industrial areas. And you see that, uh, for example, in bisphenol A, we uh, saw the presence of bisphenol A. We are talking about, of course, normal children, um, the, the exposure was quite high in all parts of Italy. And the same was for the exposure to phthalates. And probably in the case of phthalates, even the younger age was associated with a higher uh, exposure to this kind of compounds. So the exposure to uh, these major players, PFAS, we didn't study PFAS, but in other countries, PFAS have been studied. And once again, the biomonitoring studies have, have shown that the exposure to PFAS as well as to bisphenol A and uh, phthalates is quite big among uh, children. And 
what can be the, if we want to summarize the potential consequences of early exposure to the different endocrine, dispo, uh, endocrine compounds, especially uh, PFAS, uh, phthalates and bisphenol A? First of all, an effect on fetal growth, on postnatal growth, on energy metabolism, adipose tissue accretion. We already uh, know a lot of things about that from the previous speaker. Uh, about polycystic ovary syndrome risk, altered pubertal development, precocious puberty or premature telarchy, sex differentiation or genital malformations, thyroid function, Joseph is an expert on that, reproduction and fertility, we already uh, uh, heard by uh, Alexandra, so many uh, news uh, in, insights about this kind of uh, relationship, mammary gland development, predisposition to cancer, neurodevelopment, and transgenerational action. So we want to summarize in one single slide what we can um, uh, actually see after the exposure, uh, early exposure during fetal life or even uh, early postnatal life. Uh, this can be the list of potential effects. Just to remind you, this testis dysgenesis syndrome, which was uh, quite well des described by uh, Copenhagen a group led by uh, Professor Skakebeck, actually this uh, actually highlighted the increased incidence of disorders affecting male reproductive function, including hypospadia, hiptorchidism, but also the decline in the sperm count and of course the risk of testicular cancer. So once again, we have an association study, exposure to pesticide and the prevalence or incidence of testis degenerative syndrome in a specific court, uh, in, the, in this case, in the north of Europe. But if we want to, uh, I would say, quantify the evidence linking the exposure to uh, different endocrine disruptors and the potential side effect and the, in the risk of specific diseases, I think this um, table can be quite useful. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, keep in mind that actually all we know about a human beings and exposure to endocrine disruptors is um, related to association studies, non-causation studies, especially if we look at specific diseases. And you see here in this table that the highest evidence we have is uh, about the prenatal exposure to PBDAs or pesticide, but also multiple endocrine disruptors and the impact on neurodevelopment. You see IQ loss, intellectual disability, IQ loss, intellectual disability, attention deficit disorder, and also even uh, autism spectrum disorder. You see the probability of causation is for the first two um, linking, links actually up to 100%. So this means in other words, that the evidence linking the early exposure to uh, specific uh, endocrine disruptors and the impact on neurodevelopment is quite strong, uh, which is not the case for other kinds of relationships or associations. For example, uh, adult or childhood obesity, you see the evidence is quite, is quite low or very low. And even for the other kind of uh, associations, cryptorchidism, testicular cancer, the evidence is not so strong in comparison with the evidence about the, um, uh, the neurodevelopment uh, uh, impact of the exposure. But um, I think that we have to consider some problems uh, related to the, when we study the association or the causation of the exposure to specific endocrine disruptors at the potential side effect or the potential diseases as a consequence of this exposure. First of all, we are talking about mixtures. We are exposed to mixtures rather than simple substances. And this, of course, uh, makes a lot of difference because actually it's quite difficult to study mixtures, much more easy, it's much easier to study single substances. Then uh, we are talking about low dose of individual compounds. So once again, uh, we are not uh, studying, uh, I mean, a so strong contamination in our biological samples, but we had to uh, be able to pick up very low dose of the individual compounds. Then uh, many of these uh, actually effects have a, a, a transient 
adverse actions. And these actions actually uh, occur at critical time windows of development. So it, it is very difficult to pick up the right time window, the right actions at the right dose of that specific exposure. Most of these probably happen during embryogenesis, which of course makes the, uh, the study even, um, even more difficult. And many of these endocrine disruptors are not more, no longer be detectable at birth. And the other point is the uh, methodology, uh, which it, we can be used to study the exposure, for example, during fetal life or early infancy because our, the uh, labs, especially, specifically in a, in a, a clinical setting, uh, able or uh, available for uh, measuring uh, endocrine disruptors are very, very few, at least in my country. And if we want to, another uh, difficult thing is you want to uh, uh, use the Bradford Hill um, uh, list for uh, uh, Give, um, for giving a causation relationship between the exposure to specific endocrine dis disruptors and a specific disease. If we look at this, um, you know, uh, at this list of uh, viewpoint, temporality, strength of association, reproducibility, specificity, biological gradient, plausibility, experimental evidence, Probably, in, at least for many of these endocrine disruptors, we don't have um, the possibility to apply this, um, uh, this methodology uh, with the exception of coherence and analogy, especially uh, coherence, uh, which means the association are more likely to be causal if there are similar response in epidemiology and laboratory studies. In, uh, we have already known from the previous speakers that the epidemiology, epidemiological, uh, evidence is very robust, it's very strong for many of these endocrine disruptors, and uh, as well as the experimental studies in cell lines, cell cultures, primary uh, cell cultures, uh, or even, in, of course, in uh, animals, uh, the laboratory uh, evidence is quite strong, which is not the same, in, of course, in human beings. And of course, also the uh, analogy, associations are more likely to be causal if similar exposures produce similar effects. And you see that for EDC studies, uh, analogous data can be available for chemical classes or chemical analogs. So even for the analog analogy, uh, we have many, sorry, uh, many uh, actually um, uh, evidence, many uh, data showing that actually some specific uh, EDCs can um, have an impact on health of human beings, and in my case, in, on health of children. But uh, in my mind, actually the major breakthrough, uh, I would say the, the major milestone in research of endocrine disruptors, at least in children, uh, came out from the publication of this paper in Science uh, at the end of 2022, uh, is a quite a complex um, uh, you know, study, a complex uh, paper to, to read, but I warmly strongly advise you to read this paper because uh, in my mind, it is from a methodological point of view, a, a major milestone, milestone in, the, in the history of, of this field. Uh, why? Because actually in, in this study, the authors uh, start from epidemiological evidence. Actually, they studied the Selma court uh, which is a court of uh, pregnant women um, and a longitudinal court. Pregnant women and children actually followed up to the age of seven years. And they studied, uh, and originally this court was set up to study the risk of allergy and asthma. Uh, but then actually this court was used for um, uh, uh, endocrine disruptor study. And uh, they, uh, uh, withdrew biological samples, both blood and urine, from the women, from pregnant women at the 10th tenth, uh, tenth month of pregnancy. And then they studied uh, the language delay, the language actually uh, development at the age of 30 months in the infants of these women. Because why uh, the language delay is a, a marker of neurodevelopment or neurodevelopmental uh, delay. 
So they try to uh, associate the exposure to specific endocrine disruptors during pregnancy uh, from the fetus and the, the, the neurodevelopmental delay uh, later on in postnatal life. So they, uh, were, they were able to pick up different uh, exposure of these pregnant women. And you see here in this part of the slide, mainly bisphenol A, phthalates, and PFAS. Of course, these pregnant women were exposed to a mixture of these different uh, endocrine disruptors. So this group was able to uh, uh, actually produce the same kind of mixture and test this mixture first in a cell line, in a, in a cell model, and they studied the impact of these mixtures in brain stem cells and in brain organoids. And they found a change of gene expression of many different pathways. Uh, most of them related to uh, uh, endocrine pathways, endocrine systems, especially to thyroid. And then once again, after that, they use the same mixture to uh, test Xenopus levis and Dinurerio, so two animal models, to see if these, the exposure to this mixture actually changed the uh, locomotor activity of these animals, because locomotor activity is another marker of neurodevelopment in these animals. And they found that actually the exposure to this same mixture originally found in pregnant women actually had an impact on the locomotor activity of these animals. And finally, they went back to the human beings, I would say, to the children at the age of 30 months, linking the, uh, the exposure to this mixture during fetal life uh, as actually uh, um, uh, shown at the 10th uh, weeks of gestation of the mothers and the risk of uh, language delay. And they showed that the, the exposure to this same mixture of endocrine disruptors were associate, was associated with a, a, a risk, 3.3 higher risk of uh, actually problems in neurodevelopment as shown by a language delay. So I think uh, this kind of study which was once again, I uh, were to repeat this, uh, published in science at the end of last year, is very important because it offers a methodology, at least in uh, children in pediatric studies, to, to study the uh, exposure in uh, utero uh, and the, the consequences in this kind of neurodevelopment in postnatal life, in early postnatal life. This are just to give you an idea of all the pathways found changed, changed in the, um, the uh, cell line, the cell, uh, in the cell um, models uh, used in this kind of study. And you see that almost every kind of endocrine pathways were affected by the exposure to this specific mixture of phthalates, bisphenol A and PFAS. So what about the future research, at least in uh, children? First of all, uh, we have to test additional critical periods beyond prenatal and early postnatal life. Uh, I think that adolescence is an additional sensitive developmental window to study if we want to see uh, an effect of the exposure to uh, these endocrine disruptors and you know, the potential risk of diseases in adult life. Then we have to design studies to consider gender differences in response. We have preliminary uh, data showing that, for example, the exposure to bisphenol A uh, is associated with a high risk of obesity in girls, but not in males. So, for example, in this case, there is a gender difference, uh, at least in terms of risk of obesity. Uh, to perform longitudinal and multi-generational analysis in animals and in humans. Some uh, of your questions were about that. We don't have a so strong evidence about transgenerational uh, effects in human beings, but we have to study that because there are no study or at least no uh, conclusive studies in human beings. Uh, in humans, we have to consider genetic diversity and population differences in exposure and outcomes. This should include racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic variables 
once again, one, some of the, uh, your questions were about that. Uh, the, the, actually, the, the, the answer is that we don't have enough data to answer that question. To expand research to emerging uh, new endocrine disruptors of interest and mainly to mixtures, because once again, I want to stress the fact that we are exposed to mixtures of these endocrine, of these compounds. We are not exposed to, to a single substance. And finally, I think uh, for the next studies, in the, uh, for the future uh, studies, we have to think about a team science approach. Uh, we should include teams of basic translational clinical scientists, epidemiologists, healthcare providers, public health professionals. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, team needs to be a priority for future research and funding. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much um, for the presentation, uh, Stefano, bringing, uh, let's say, everything together at the end uh, from the periodic, uh, pediatric point of view. I think we have a few minutes left, maybe for two or three uh, questions uh, to kind of get a little bit in the in the deeper uh, discussion. Um, Anna Maria Anderson, my co-lead of the um, working group and focus area, asks whether the evidence of association to non-persistent chemicals may be underestimated due to the more uncertain exposure estimates in contrast to the uh, persistent ones. Well, Do you have yeah, I, I mean, I, I think my feeling is that actually a, some uh, some points of view is more easy to study the persistent because in, in that case we uh, we don't have a day to day uh, variation. So uh, even when we talk about association analysis, uh, you know, it, it, it's completely different. We we are uh, studying a persistent pollutant, a persistent yeah. substance. So I, I think we still have. Uh, a weak uh, um, evidence for the non-persistent, just given to the fact that it's more difficult to study that. Uh, and probably we should, for example, in our study in non-persistent bisphenol A and phthalates, we just uh, took you know, a snapshot of one single day, but we don't know what happened the day after, the day before our analysis. So this makes the, the study much more difficult for non-persistent pollutants. Yeah, I think uh, a, a short comment to that. There is more and more studies coming out now. Uh, I think even from various cohorts, uh, mother-child cohorts, pediatric and uh, adult ones, that they have meanwhile not only one single sample analysis, but multiple time points of analysis during yeah. pregnancy, after pregnancy. And they have done also longitudinal observations up to 10, 12, 15 years meanwhile. And I think these long-term multiple sampling, multiple analysis scored are so strong data with yeah. sample size, which is really strong so that I think epidemiology and prospective epidemiology really gives us a lot of information and solid information. And I think we are not yeah. anymore guessing. We are yeah. having facts. No, no doubt about that. No doubt. We need that, that kind of studies. Yeah. Uh, there was one point. I think uh, my answer would be uh, clear. Um, but I would like ask, can exercise reduce the level of endocrine disruptors? Obviously, babies don't exercise, <laughs> but uh, the adult ones do. What is your opinion about that one? Oh, I don't think there is any single study on that, to be honest, at least in a childhood. Yeah. Uh, so I, I could answer with a, uh, with a robust kind of evidence. <laughs> yeah. I think the point is similar to, to the, um, the issue of the obesity. Whenever, let's say, a pregnant woman um, mobilizes fat, during lactation, during pregnancy, the, uh, let's say, stored accumulated compounds are uh, entering the system. Yeah, They are not stored away anymore. So I would probably think that exercise at the beginning would mobilize exposure, increase transiently, but it might on the long term be beneficial. But we are speculating on that. There is uh, one comment. Um, 
from uh, comparing the, the study you mentioned by the Caporale Science paper. There is a big cohort, about 1,000 children in Germany, that looked on metabolic parameters and obesity, starting with pregnant mothers and afterwards their children. There had been regular follow-ups until the age of 11 with bioprobes. And this might especially be of interest. This exactly, I didn't see this comment, but it's exactly the okay, same yes, line, yes. the yeah, same yeah. line what we are seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I hear and see also for the previous speakers a lot of um, very good comments and uh, uh, applauses and uh, thanks for the excellent presentation. I think going over time, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, contributing here with really different perspectives of the complex problem of endocrine disruptors. Uh, Stefano, Alexandra, Ankel, and I would also especially like to thank the organizers of the Endocrine Society, especially the team by Gemma Boyd, Claire Arigioni, and the background people that we get the opportunity to have this ESC talk series here. And I would everybody invite to come in again tomorrow for the uh, tomorrow's presentation, which will be, I think, giving very solid information again on this and further uh, events by ESE. And I think we need more people actively working on that, contributing in the working groups, in the focus area, and at the national level that we kind of advance the knowledge, communicate the knowledge, and try to prevent, let's say, as much as possible and change the exposure for everybody. So thanks all of you. Thanks so many actually special compliment to those who stayed over time for more than 30 minutes. I have the impression it was worth staying there and I wish for the uh, tomorrow's session good luck and success and thank you all. Have a nice evening and we see you soon again somewhere at an endocrine meeting at the national level or in the science community. Have a nice evening everybody. Thank you Joseph. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.